Well, as Sarah said, welcome to the Computer Science Masochist Club. You're, you all build VMs, so you obviously enjoy pain. Um, if you want more pain, I encourage you to do garbage collection. Um, so, uh, I mean, Cl Cliff pointed out a number of problems and how to overcome them. Um, and he said certain things were hard. Building garbage collections <coughs> is hard. If you build a mark sweep garbage collector and forget to mark something, you die. Probably a lot, lot, lot later than when you missed it. Um, if you're building a concurrent garbage collector, if you miss an edge in the live program graph, you die. Um, and the, the, now we're just talking about simple stop the world collectors. If you want more pain, you make the collector parallel, so you've got lots of collector threads. <coughs> if that's not pain enough, well, let's make it concurrent. Um, so the, the user program is running at the same time as the garbage collector. That wasn't enough pain for us. So we decided to build a fully on-the-fly copying garbage collector. So there are no pauses ever. Uh, uh, although, admittedly, each, stack is, each thread is halted while its scan is stacked. But nothing is halted simultaneously. So this is possibly the most painful way of doing it. Um, so what I would, thought I would talk to you today, I'll share the experiences we had of building that. And in particular, I wanted to focus on what we could do and approaches we could take to give you some confidence um, that what we built was actually correct. And how you can get a handle on building these complex systems um, so you can actually comprehend what you're doing. So, uh, um, so um, I'll give a, a quick <coughs> out overview of some, some algorithms because I, I don't know what your GC background is. <coughs> Who's built garbage collectors? I know you have. Right, some of you. Who thinks they have a good understanding of garbage collection? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting the people who build them to well, keep their hands down. <laughs> right, so I, 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 I'm going to give a little, very, very brief outline of that. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the things that we, we did. Um, to, to partly to make this fast and then partly to make sure that we're, we are correct. Um, I have to give credit to the smart guys who, who, who really did most of the work in our, uh, in our implementation. Uh, my colleague Carl and uh, Tomoharu from uh, Kochi University in Japan. Um, so here we go, GC background. So this is very brief. I'm only going to consider tracing collectors. I'm not going to talk about reference counting at all. Um, so the simplest kind of uh, collector um, is probably, or tracing collector anyway. Actually, the simplest kind of collector, I will say that. People think reference counting is simple. It is simple until you do it for real and try to make it work with threads. And then it is appallingly difficult. Um, my view is don't go there. But. So the simplest one is a mark, mark sweep collector. We have um, some collection of roots so, so, um, up here. And we start tracing the object graph. And you know, we find an object, we mark it, um, we discover it has some children. Um, we, so we go on and we mark them. We've probably got uh, some kind of auxiliary stack structure to keep track of the branch points in that graph. Um, and eventually we'll go on and we'll, we'll discover that this one has some, some children here. We'll mark them and we'll discover that this one um, is not reachable. And at the end of the mark phase, we'll sweep through the heap um, and find any object that's not marked uh, and uh, we'll reclaim it. So that, that's a basic mark sweep collector. Um, the way I, I've drawn this is I've, I've colored black the objects that the garbage collector has found and has, in a sense, finished with. Because it's discovered this object, <laughs> it's discovered it has a couple of children, um, so it's, it's remembering those. Um, I've conceptually coloured them grey. Not that that doesn't actually necessarily mean anything physical has happened to these objects, because I know about them because they're on my mark stack. Um, but it gives us an interest, a useful way of keeping track of the garbage collector's sort of wave front as it passes through the the graph of live objects. <coughs> so we've got a bunch of objects that you've already seen. And then you've got this little grey wave front 
of objects that you've got to do something with, that you're not finished with yet. Um, and it turns out that that is a kind of really, really useful abstraction. And I'm going to talk about that more and more as we go on. So that's um, Mark's Sweet Collection. Yeah, makes sense? problem with Mark Sweep is it doesn't uh, compact the heap, and your heap is likely to fragment. Uh, if you have long-running applications, they will uh, fragment. Uh, if you talk to Tony Printasis, who used to be the Sun's le lead engineer on the G1, and now he's at Twitter. It always astonishes me at, that Tony's at Twitter. Some are more social media averse in the past I've never known, but <laughs> anyway. Um, um, <coughs> He'll tell you that he's only interested in applications that run for weeks, and he, he says you do need to compact every few garbage collections, otherwise you're, 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 you're just going to, you're going to die. Um, um, so, but um, simple mark sweep collection doesn't do that. So another style is copying collection, and I'm going to show you an example. It's based on sort of the, the very old Cheney style collector, um, which is kind of cute because it doesn't need any auxiliary stack. So suppose I've got some kind of um, data structure that I, um, and it's all going to be live. I haven't got any data objects here. Uh, I divide the world up into two parts. I have what's usually called a from space and a to space. And the idea is I'm going to copy all the objects that are in, in my um, from all the live objects in my from space and pack them densely into two space. So the way we do that is we start at the roots, we copy the root, um, and we just copy it completely so it's still got pointers back into, to, into from space. Um, we have to remember where we've been, so we leave a forwarding address uh, just in case we, ha we have any uh, shared objects. Because we'd really like to preserve the topology. <laughs> You do not want to unwrap cycles or, or, or cyclic data structures, otherwise your collector would not terminate. Um, so here we have, we've copied it. Uh, we've got a couple of pointers, scan and free. Um, so scan tells us what object we've got to look at next. Free tells us where we can allocate next to it as, as part of copying. So I look at that, that L1. And I see that I've got to um, copy the two things it pointed to, and I need to update the, the pointers there. Again, I have the forwarding addresses. Um, I've finished with that one, so I've coloured it grey, uh, sorry, black. Um, the ones I've got to do are grey. In other words, the ones between the scan and free pointers are grey. Uh, so I carry on doing that. So the next one points to B, so I copy that across. Uh, the next one points, I can't remember where it pointed it, and so on, and so on, um, uh, until we get to here. Um, and the interesting thing here is um, that this gives us a, a pointer back to, 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 to E as well. And now, scan and free have met each other, so we're finished. And you see that it's quite kind of hard to see, but the topology of the heap, heap um, should be correct. <coughs> Okay. And that, that, that's copying collection. And the advantage of it is it, is it compacts things. Uh, the other style of collection, which I haven't talked about today because it's, um, it's not so relevant, is mark compact. So first phase, you mark everything. And the second phase, you compact it by sliding everything up. Uh, Cliff was saying how important it was to keep things in allocation order because those are the order that programs tend to access objects. Um, there are lots of ways of doing uh, compaction. You can move objects around in a sort of arbitrary fashion, or you can slide them. Um, and it, sliding tends to give you the best locality, but um, that's sort of what I want to talk about today. Right, so I mentioned this abstraction. It's, it's a tricolor abstraction. I guess it's originally due to, 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 to Dijkstra. Um, and we can divide the world into three kinds of object, or three colors of object. Um, ones that are white have not yet been reached by the garbage collector. Ones that are gray have been visited by the garbage collector, 
but maybe the fields need to be scanned or maybe it needs to be looked at again. Um, and ones coloured black have been visited by the collector and all fields have been scanned. And in a sense, the garbage collector is done with those. Um, so, uh, how can we tell when we finished garbage collection? Just in terms of that abstraction. No grey. No grey. No Everything's black and it's live or it's white and it's dead. But there's no grey. Right? So um, the goal of your, of your collector is keep on doing work until its, um, its, set of, its work list of grey objects is empty. Uh, and in the, um, in the stop the world world, uh, that's quite straightforward. Um, you know, you know. In the copying collection, the grey objects were the ones between the scan and the three-pointer. Um, in the uh, mark sweep world, the grey objects are one of the things on your mark stack. And you can tell when your mark stack is empty, and you can tell when your scan and three-pointers have met each other. The world has stopped. No other threads doing, what did you say? Oh, no, it's, it's the garbage collector that does brain surgery, isn't it? Yeah. So while the garbage collector is doing brain surgery, the application is not thinking. So. So we're good. It's easy. Yeah. Comparatively easy. Right. All happy with that. Okay, so let's move, move on. Talk a little bit about parallel, incremental, and concurrent GC. Uh, if you read the literature in the past, some of these terms, like this, particularly concurrent and, and parallel, used to be muddled and, and muddied. Um, I think it's useful to have a standard terminology, which... Some of us have worked hard to establish, and I hope so. I guess my, my, my understanding is that my terminology is the right one. <laughs> Although any, any contradictory ones are wrong. Yeah. Would you agree with that, Tony? Absolutely. See, <laughs> independent corroboration. <laughs> right, so here we are. This is a stop the world. So the idea of these pictures is we have time running along. The, the bars are meant to be, the white bars are meant to be mutator threads. Um, and so you have all your mutator threads running along, uh, and then you stop them all, and you do the first garbage collection, and then you let them run again. Stop them all, do the second garbage collection, and so on. Yeah? What's the problem with that? Why is that? I'm not. Big GC pause time. You've got big GC pause time, because you've got, you know, I've got loads of. Processor resource because I'm running threads, and I'm only using one of them. And I'm only using one core to do my GC. The other cores are sitting there, twiddling their thumbs. So that's not the world. Um, so one way to make it better is make it parallel. So here we have lots of GC threads, and so their the pores have shrunk because they're they're doing work in parallel. Now, there's questions about how much um, parallelism you can get out of of this, because if you think of things like um, uh, a mark sweep collector, or any tracing collector, if you're tracing down a linear list, there's not as much parallel work to do that. But in practice, there is lots of work for a parallel garbage collector to do. And um, I'm going to say that all high-performance systems have parallel garbage collection. I believe that's true. But then you, you can discuss what you think is a high-performance system. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> so that, that's parallel garbage collection. Um, another way to do incremental collection, uh, here we have the, the new data threads running, and they probably pause briefly to do some kind of coordination, synchronization. Typically what you do there is you'll examine all of your thread stacks, so you get a set of routes for the garbage collectors to start from. And then you let the... the um, the threads do a little bit of garbage collection work as they go. Um, typically, you might piggy that on the map of the allocator. So when you allocate the memory, you do a bit of GC work, and so on. Um, another style is mostly concurrent. So here we are. Um, we have the threads running. And then again, we have this brief pause to synchronize. Typically, again, is to get the, the, um, 
to collect the roots from each of the thread stacks. So you pause all the threads, all of them at the same time. So there's a stop the world pause, and you, you look at the roots, and then you restart the mutators, but the, the collector's working in, alongside, concurrently, with, with the, uh, the um, uh, mutagrotic roots. And of course, I've just drawn one uh, GC thread. You could have lots of GC threads. So you, could have it, you could have it parallel and concurrent. <coughs> Or if you want to really make it really hard for yourself, you have on-the-fly collection. So there are no pauses. Uh, we stop the threads <coughs> one at a time. You can see this sort of ragged boundary here. But the idea there is we stop the thread one at a time. We scanned its stack, and then we restart it. Because there's no point at which all 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 uh, um, all mutators. If I say mutator, I mean I mean the user threads. Um, there's no point when they're all all halted. And again, you can have more than one um, uh, uh, collector thread. So the the the, the 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 collector I'm going to talk about is like this. It's on the fly. It has, and it's parallel as well. Um, so I think we we made it as hard as we could. So it's based on. Um, fairly old algorithm called Sapphire. Um, Sapphire is an on-the-fly, that means it never stops all the threads. Uh, concurrent, um, well, if you are on the fly, you are concurrent. I guess that's, that's repetition. It's a replicating GC, which means it constructs a replica of the, the live heap in two space while the mutators are running. Um, it was originally built by Hudson and Moss. Um, um, as I said, never stops one more than one thread at a time. Use copying, so we get fast allocation. The advantage of compacting the heap is that if we want to allocate an object, we just match up pointer, we just bump the pointer up by the size of the object. And it's kind of hard to get faster than that. It's faster than using something like a free list and picking things off the free list, and, and so on. Uh, we don't have fragmentation. The way that Sapphire is designed is that the GC pays most of the cost um, uh, of, of synchronization. I'll talk more about synchronization later in some of the issues. But the idea is to put all the burden on the collector and not on the mutator, because you want your mutators to run fast. Um, it's, um, it's not a hard real-time collector. By a hard real-time collector, I mean one that gives you guaranteed deadlines that it will never miss. Um, to do that kind of thing, you need to have uh, information on the behavior of the user program, like its allocation rate and so on, and that needs to be provided a priori. It's not intended for that. It's intended for, for something, a system with a, a, a reasonable number of threads, um, which gives you um, uh, reasonable guarantees of how long something is going to take place. So if you're going to use it for your um, safety critical, I don't know, missile defense system or something, <coughs> I wouldn't bother. Um, in fact, I'm not sure I bother with a garbage collector for writing my missile defense system. Or, or choose, uh, choose something more friendly than that. I couldn't I can think of it. Um, it's built in uh, JAX RBM. Um, JAX is uh, quite widely used um, virtual machine for research. The nice thing about JAX is it's easy to, to implement new ideas. Um, the less nice thing about JAX is it's nowhere near as fast as Hotspot is these days. Um, um, and as I said, it's largely written in Java. So Cliff told us that next time he wrote, he wrote a, a, a virtual machine, he wouldn't write it in C or C++. Well, here's one that's already baked, written in Java. So let's look a little at how Sapphire works, and we'll, then we'll go into some of the, the, um, the, the, the details. So Sapphire operates in a number of phases. Um, we talked earlier about Mark's Sweet collection, and that clearly has two phases. Um, well, probably re really got three phases. First phase, collect the roots. Second phase, mark the live object up. Third phase, um, 
sweep all the, all the dead objects under a chain. So, um, Zappa has a number of phases, and I'll indicate the, the main <coughs> phase of these. So, before we start running a collector, uh, collection, here we have, here's the mutator. Um, we've got from space and to space. Uh, we've got a couple of objects here. Um, and from space is, uh, the mutator's reading and writing to from space. So it's only got one space, so it's only got one space it can read and write. So we start off doing marking. And the way marking happens in Sapphire is first of all, um, the collector traces the graph and creates empty shells in two space. Um, and it's leaving a forwarding address in the headers indicating where it's put those shells. So it's trying to create a replica. So the first stage, you just make the, these, these empty replicas. Does mean you have to have a pointer space in each header? Yeah. yeah. So that's the cost. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Um, yeah. Um, as I said, mutators still still working from space. The next phase is to, to start fill it, filling um, <coughs> filling the the the, cons the bodies of these objects in. Um, and again, we still have the, the, the mutator is 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 uh, reading from from space. Um, we're trying to create the these um, replicas. Um, I think this. Uh, Yellowish one had a pointer to the brown object, yeah. So we've got to make sure that uh, in two space our yellow copy points to the copy of the brown one. Um, so, our, for want of a better name, we call that a semantic copy because it's, it's doing a copy trying to preserve the shape of the, the, the graph. Now, um, the nasty thing about this is that while I'm doing this, the mutator. Um, might change my data in here. And I better make sure that that's reflected here. So although I'm reading from this space, I'm having to do a double write. I'm having to write to both spaces. And that's true of both pointer data and scalar data, non-pointer data. So eventually I finish doing that, and the next thing I have next phase is I have to flip. Um, um, so now I'm trying to deal with two space. Question about that. Yeah. Is like, would it be insane to not write to both spaces but check afterwards? <coughs> um, you, you can't close the cycle. You have to check and then the, update. The problem is when when would you check? I mean, I mean there, are, there, there are two th two things I think. First of all, is what happens if the mutator changes some some slots in an object? while I'm trying to copy that object. Yeah. And then, yes, I could check later. But what happens if I'm the GC and I think I'm completely finished with that object? Do I want to go and then um, come back? Now, some of the early replicating collectors kept a log of all the changes that had been made and then tried to stop the world and try, well, and then tried to reapply that log and then checked again, is it, is it because you, you then have a new log of changes and kept on doing that until the log was empty. And that's what the original Nettles No Tool one did. Um, uh, the way Sapphire works is it, 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 it writes to both spaces. So when we go to the flip phase, again, but it's kind of switched round. Um, this time the mutators are reading from uh, two space and writing to both spaces. Because the problem is that while one mutator might have recognized the flip, another mutator might not, because we never stop the whole world to synchronize. So all our phase change boundaries are, are ragged. And we'll talk about that. And finally, um, when you finish, it all looks, I guess, the jewel of what it did before, when everything was in two space. Does that make sense? Is there a period of time when you're not doing collection then, or does the answer Yes, you yes, know? Well, yes, and, and that's an interesting question. We, we spent some time recently trying to think when we should trigger GCs, because because of all the things going on, and I'll talk about what some of the costs are. 
while you're doing a collection, the new pages are going to run slow because they're writing to two spaces for a start. So it's good to have them, not for now. But then you have to decide at what point am I going to trigger a collection because you don't want to run out of space. Um, but on the other hand, you don't want collections running back to back because then the mutators run slower all the time. So um, I'm, a, I'm not going to talk about it. But it's in, in, an interesting question of when to, to trigger, um, to do these triggers. Um, and I guess we don't have a, a particularly good answer. I mean, what we've done is we've said, um, um, uh, we said collect after so much allocation. And so much allocation varies from benchmark to benchmark. Um, and the reason we've done that is we said, well, how much heap space are you prepared to pay, if you like? You know, and and you would like you would like to tune it so that um, you don't run out of, of space. Because if you do run out of space, the next collection is a stop the world collection. Yeah, so the Zill collector is basically you know, something similar on the fly. It's not doing a copy game, but has the same problem with when do you trigger a collection? And we spent a bunch of time on uh, heuristics that looked at uh, historical allocation rate of application and tracking time to allocation rate was how long until your heap ran out was time until the heap ran out plus last cycle time to run a collection and you did a bunch of math to decide you know, launch it soon enough that you still had some slot headroom. Yeah. On when yeah. It's, it's a lot of yeah. the, the trouble with that is that some, some benchmarks have a very much of a sore face behavior. They sort of go front along steadily, and then suddenly their allocation spike. rate peaks, and, so and then the it drops off. The collector would, when I mean, the first time it happened in the arc collector, would panic mode, collect hard right away. Yeah. Uh, and then after you went through a few step cycles, it got fed into the heuristic and it was okay. Yeah. The first one, it, it jumped in hard right away. Yeah. I mean, our, the trick that we've done has it's been a mission <laughs> very simplistic. You know, we, we've done this profiling, this shows a trigger. Um, <coughs> just, I suppose, partly in the way to get, give us a, a baseline for doing fair comparisons against other systems, you know, which is said, well, we don't want to have too much more heat than they do. And, you know, but, you know, try, trying to compare apples with apples as, as much as we can. Um, <coughs> and it's certainly the truth, there are some, some benchmarks, some of the Decapo benchmarks, um, have such high allocation rates that it's very difficult for our, our, the system to keep up in any kind of reasonable heap size because they did have a peak and they shoot up. Um, so, I mean, I mean, I would very much say you, you choose your you choose your collector for the pu for the purpose that you have at hand, um, and I don't think there's one collector that fits all. And if you look at if you look at something like um, um, some uh, Oracle's hotspot. Um, it has a number of collectors. Uh, although garbage first is is G1 collector, is now the default collector. There are loads of customers of Sun who will say it's useless for, for, for our application, and we want the old <coughs> um, parallel um, concurrent mark sweep one. So that's how it works. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, we don't sweep the front space. Hmm? We don't sweep front space. Yeah. So what about the we just discard it all. Okay, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when we've, when we've done the flip, when we've done that, that's just, front space is discarded. It's all, it's all given back to the, um, well, if you like the camp page level allocator. But after having closed all threads, we can... No, we don't close all threads. And what if the, let's say this is a, Oh, we pause. We pause. You need to run this process for all threads, and then only then can you discard it. What, what do I need to run for all threads? The uh, well, all these phases. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. So, so the way it works, you have a bunch of, as you have these phase transitions, you have a bunch of handshakes between DC and um, and DJ. So the DC won't move on until it recognizes it. Until it knows that all threads are broken, <coughs> <and> all threads <coughs> are broken. Um, so th but there's no point when we stop everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is there a progress guarantee? I mean, do you know that every phase is going to be? Um, I mean, you monitor monitoring the increasing or decreasing something. 
way to, um, if you like, to stop progress is if you have an allocator that's allocating at such a prodigious rate that they can't keep up with it. I mean, if, you're, if, you're, if your Java program says, well, I'll show you new, um, I'm going to struggle to keep up with that rate of allocation. So eventually I'm going to run out of people. <coughs> because there's no way that I can, I can <coughs> there's no way, I think there's no way that any collector can, can, can um, collect fast enough to do that. Unless, I suppose, unless you had an incremental one which put a tax on the mutator, so well, you just said new, you better do some work, buddy. Are you saying it's dependent on the scheduling between No, I'm saying it's dependent on, well, I'm assuming, I'm assuming you, you <laughs> let's say your, your mutator is running scheduled on one core and your DC is scheduled on, they're both running as fast as they can. Right. But if the, if the allocator is great, you just run faster. Yeah. You know, it's not much work to do to just say new, it's, you know, <laughs> pointer equals pointer plus size. I, I'm struggling. I'm struggling to do anything to keep up with that. What's the concern? Of determination. Sorry. What's the concern? Progress. Or what's the concern? He said progress. Of the collector. Of the whole system. I thought you meant. I think that's what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so new carries a hidden extra tax. It's always a cash line that's never in anyone's cash. So you get a cash mess. Yeah. And then you fill full zeros, which cash writes back out. So you have a lot of memory bandwidth overhead, actually, for that continuously newing guy. Right. The GC guy has a different overhead cost because he doesn't have to, to write back every possible thing. You just have to verify that no one's touching the thing that's not being mentioned. That's true. That's true. So you could possibly keep up with the guy going wow, true, new, with just one breath because you actually don't have this high cost. On that piece, right? Or right. other, all other overheads have to be, okay. you know. Okay, but if it said while true, new, mm -hmm. and add it to the end of the list, my line. No, yeah, then, then your heap grows without balance. Yeah. And now you run out of memory. You only do it with your GC. That's, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, this, assuming that you, you never have a live heap beyond some fraction of your total memory. I think what I would say is I suspect that for any 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 garbage collector algorithm, I could write a simple adversary <coughs> that would make life very difficult for, for it. Yeah. Here's a thought experiment inspired by Dave Unger's methodology on you know, thinking of what the devil would do. Um, so allocation is, this rate of allocation is bounded by how fast you initialize memory. The rate at which garbage is created is not bounded. You can create an arbitrarily large amount snipping one link. And so in the worst case, the devil makes the heap fill to you know one byte below before um, before the overflow occurs and then snips the one link that makes it all dead. Yeah. It's really difficult to talk with books. It doesn't it doesn't cause a huge pause because it's all <coughs> dead. The time to collect an empty heap is really short. You're not, you know, the, the, yeah. in, the interesting cost is if you have a complicated heap structure you have to walk uh, that's all live, yeah. plus you're getting an interesting amount of feedback that the collector's going to, yeah, the, the user's going to fill again. The nasty way is, as you say, you've got to make the, you've got to make the set of objects that the collector thinks are live grow and grow and grow. And then you can do the snip. Yeah. But the problem is the collector, any, con any contractor has this notion of floating garbage. Because yeah. it, it, in a sense, it takes a snapshot at the beginning. Anything that was live at the beginning, reachable at the beginning, it thinks is live. Um, so we, we, I think we ought to move on, actually. Um, uh, and some of these things are addressed. So, you know, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> so, one of the, the classic problems for, 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 um, for any kind of concurrent, incremental collector is the lost object form. This is that the mutator, your adversary, hides a live object, a reach, live and reachable object <laughs> from the collector. So here, here's a classic example. So um, here we have, this is, a, this is our set of objects. The, um, the mutator has marked these objects 
you know, it's finished for them. It knows about the children, so they're black. So these are black, we're finished with. This is black, we're finished with. Marked it, we know about its children. This one we know about, but we haven't <coughs> not examined it yet and looked at its children. <coughs> so at this point, the mutator comes along, it copies, it copies that pointer, so we now we've got and puts it into, into um, the black X object, and now it removes this pointer. So we're down here. The GC resumes. It says, oh, I've got to look at this grey object. It has no children. So I'm on that one black. I have no grey objects left. I'm finished. Uh, anything that's white I can reclaim. Oh, dear. Um, so that's one way of, of uh, losing objects. Another way is a sort of transitive version of that. Um, so um, this time the mutator is hiding a transitively reachable one. So it's essentially the same. These are black, this is grey. Um, now the mutator copies uh, this pointer into here. Um, uh, now this is, is, uh, is, is GC looks at that one, it's black, oh dear, and we're, we're dead again. So uh, the question is, what can we, we do about that? How can we recognize that? And in a sense, how can we think about that? And I hope you see this idea of thinking about things in terms of colors is really quite useful. You know, it's, it's telling us what the progress of our, our collective wavefront is. So tricolor abstraction helps us again here. And there are a number of conditions that I've, I've always attributed them to Paul Wilson, but I don't know if anyone actually wrote these down beforehand. So a little thought experiment. What do we have to have for things to go wrong? Um, and um, an object can only be, a reachable object can only fail to be collected if two conditions apply. First of all, a mutator has stored a pointer to a white object into a black object. Um, like that. Or the previous one. And all paths from any grey object to that white object are destroyed. Because if there's a path from a grey object, the GC is going to come along, find that grey object, and eventually trace its way down to the white object. And so we have to enforce invariance that will prevent one or other of these conditions arising. So again, you know, the tricolor abstraction really helps with this. You know, we've now lifted our, our level of discussion to the level of colors and things, and we're going to think about invariance that enforce conditions on those colors. So there are two invariants we might choose to have. The first one, we might have a rule that there are no pointers from black to white objects. So that things like that, banned. Or rather, by banned, I mean we recognize and we do something about it. And that will prevent the first condition. See? Condition one. The second one is the weak invariant, which says that if you do have a pointer from a black to a white object, there is another path from a grey object through a set of white objects, and that will prevent condition two. Okay, so those are the invariants that we want to enforce, and we can enforce those by using uh, barriers. Um, I mean, Cliff was mentioning as all which uses read barriers. I'm going to mainly concentrate on systems which use write barriers. The problem with read barriers is Traditionally, they've been very expensive. Azul got round this because it had support from the operating system and the hardware. Um, at this point, just the operating system. Yeah, yeah, at this point, just the operating system. But, yeah. but originally, originally, you, the, the Vega machines had hardware support. Yeah, hardware right? support, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So, what we want is some, um, we want to maintain these invariants with barriers. Now, a barrier is a mutator action that you wrap a load. You wrap around a load, so you've got some kind of pointer load or pointer store, depending on the read barrier or write barrier, and you do something. Um, 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 and there are two, two um, styles of barrier, um, one of which um, deals with these pointer insertions, which we've called a, an insertion barrier, and one of which deals with um, deletions, which we've called a deletion barrier. Other names of them are incremental update or snapshot at the beginning. Um, it's called incremental update because you, you incrementally update your knowledge of the, or the collector's knowledge of, of the graph. Um, 
This is called snapshot at the beginning because, it, in a sense, it preserves the graph as it was at the beginning of collection, roughly. So, um, I highly recommend an article by Perrine, and it was in ISMM, International Symposium on Memory Management, in 1998. <coughs> it, it's got a really clear account of the possible kinds of barrier that you can have. Um, and it extends this idea of, of color from the object graph to the threads themselves. Um, I suppose you can probably read about it in some book or the other. But, uh, <laughs> so um, we can think of two kinds of, of mutator. Um, we can think of gray mutators, which means the roots still need to be traced or, or need to be rescanned. If you think of the roots as maybe being the, the thread stack. Uh, the reason for this is they might point to grey or, or black or white objects. Um, and, uh, and the key problem is, is point, they might point to white. The other cut style of mutator is a black one, which means its roots have been traced and it will never be rescanned. Just in where we have black objects in the heap, it means we don't have to rescan them. So, um, and black mutators can support one or two invariants. Um, the strong invariant is they never point to white objects. The weak one is they might point to um, white objects that are, in a sense, protected by a grey one because there's a point of, uh, and a path from a grey object to the, to the white object. And if you think of these in terms of the colours of the objects and the colours of the mutators, then you can understand what possible techniques you, you can have. So, uh, broadly, a grey mutator... Um, um, uh, we can support we can support that with the, the strong invariant by having an insertion right barrier. So if I'm going to write a pointer from a black object to a white one, I make that white one grey first. I put it on a work list for the collector to look at later. Okay. Um, similarly, if I have a black mutator, um, I I can supports the weak invariant, which is, um, so when, I've, when I delete this pointer from, a, from some color, it could be white or gray or whatever, I grade the target. Um, I can also support a strong invariant by using a read barrier, but I'm, I'm not, not talking about those now. So I need to move on a bit faster. Right, so, what else is nasty? Um, Termination of a trace is varies between whether you have a, a grey mutator or a black one. If you, in both cases, you basically trace until no, no grey objects remain. Um, mutators, if there's a grey mutator, you can hold grey or white ones, so you have to have a loop. You scan each thread. If you find any objects that need tracing, you trace them until your work list is empty. And then you look back and you scan each thread and see if it's got any references to, 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 um, to, to grey objects. Again. And you keep on doing that until you finish. Um, and you can see there's, you know, this could go on for a long time. Uh, if you've got a black object mutator, you just trace until no grey objects remain and you know that you're, there are no grey objects left. Your stack, because it, it's black, can't point to white objects, you're finished. So people like to use um, deletion um, barriers because they get this fast termination. So what I talk, said I was going to talk about termination and initialization. What about initialization? That's trickier. The thing about um, mostly concurrent uh, collectors, they stop the world briefly to scan or mutate the thread stacks so you get a consistent state. So they can use either an insertion barrier or a deletion barrier. It's fine. If you're doing it fully up, on the current, you would say, well, I'd like to use a deletion barrier because I get this nice termination, but it's not possible to use it all the time. The problem is so some of your thread stacks might have been scanned and some might not. So you might have one stack that's been scanned, black, uh, another thread stack that hasn't been scanned. Um, I decide to um, mutate the site, it's going to put a pointer uh, in in there, and it's going to delete this pointer. We don't usually have 
uh, barriers are on, on stack loads um, because it's too expensive. Um, and so you can see now I've got a black to white pointer, it's not very protected, I'm going to die. Um, so um, if you're using an on-the-fly collection, you, people <coughs> often use a mixture of a, an insertion barrier and a deletion barrier until they've scanned all the routes and then they can switch to a deletion barrier for easy termination. So it gets tricky. Well, what else gets tricky? Phase transitions. If you're doing a stop the world collection, uh, or most of the concurrent collection, things are, in a sense, easy, because all your phase transitions are synchronous. Every mutator is in one phase, or every mutator is in the other phase. Um, so there's no chance of um, one mutator observing one phase and one mutator observing another <laughs> phase. And this is what this diagram is, is, is meant to indicate. So all of these, all of these mutators, the red ones, are either observing uh, um, state A or the GC has changed phase and, and they're all observing um, um, uh, state B. What about on, on the fly collection? Well, on the fly collection, our phase changes are ragged because we don't want to stop everything. And a mutator will not recognize that the phase has changed until it reaches a GC save point. And Cliff talked about letting threads move forwards till they reach a save point, because that's a, a pretty efficient way to do it. Um, and the consequence of that is your collector can't start work on a new phase until it knows that every mutator thread has recognized that the phase is going to change. And these um, mutators um, might observe different phases. And I guess the earliest work that I know that was done by that was by Dolligay and Gontier in Popple, 94. Um, what we did, we looked at and we tried to generalize this. Um, and we believe there are, there are two um, design patterns that cover all possible um, transitions. Um, the first we call a type one, which is basically just recognizing that the phase has changed. Um, and we simply insert an intermediate phase <coughs> between phase A and phase B, where the GC is basically doing not much more than handshaking with each mutator at their GC save points to recognize that something has happened. So it, knows, so it knows that all the mutators have recognized that the phase is going to change. And once it's done that, you know, once it's done the last handshake, then it can carry on as phase B. Type two phase change is caused by the fact that the invariance that we might be enforcing in this phase might contradict the invariance we're enforcing in that stage. Think of what I, the, my example of Sapphire, when we were in one phase we were reading um, from, from, from space, and in another phase we were reading from two space. Um, th those, those are contradictory. So if you need to do that, we need two phases, two intermediate phases, and typically what happens um, in the first phase is the mutators change to using um, a different barrier, which is usually more complicated and usually basically supporting the, or at least not contradicting the invariance of either this phase or this phase. So um, when I'm in that, that phase, um, I, I'll know that some mutators might be in the previous phase, some might be in the next phase, and so on. Have to be more and then the, uh, the, the, the second phase, we switch to the new barrier. So it's a two-step. And that, that kind of design pattern, we believe, captures um, all possible phase transitions in a, an on-the-fly collector. So thinking about this kind of design pattern, again, helps you think about how to manage the, these phase changes. Right, what else? Let's say a bit about what we did that was new in, in Sapphire. We made it transactional. Um, um, we took advantage of Intel's Haswell architecture, which provides um, um, transactions, basically, hardware transactions. Um, um, they're very easy to use. Essentially, you say, you should next begin to start a transaction. You do whatever you like. Ordinary plain reads. You don't have to worry about CAS or whatever and things like that. Um, um, and then you finish with, um, oops, with X end, and that's the end of your transaction. And it either succeeds or it aborts. And if it aborts, you're given the reason. Um, 
It's, these transactions are essentially based on looking at the, um, what changes in the L1 cache, and it lets you do our experiment about 16 kilobytes of reads and writes, um, and, and it can cope with those. So um, the, the, the bad downsides of it is that setting up a transaction is fairly expensive. It costs about the same as three CAS operations, and the fallback of the transaction fails is, is, is quite expensive because you've got to do it with something again. So, now, Sapphire does this copying. Remember, it's copying uh, when, it's, when it's in this stage, when it's copy phase, we're writing to both. Okay? And at the same time, the mutator is writing, writing um, to both. The GC is also trying to fill in the data. So there's a potential race. So the, the original CAS, uh, Sapphire, used compare and swaps to do that copy. So every field copy was done with a compare and swap, which is, which is kind of horrid. So um, this is very roughly the, the code for doing a compare and swap. You, you do a load from two space, you do a load from prompt space. The reason I've said load rather than just read is because you've got these issues of, of doing this semantic copy. You've got to make sure you, what you want to write is it's, if it's a, a, a pointer, it's got to be a pointer to the two-space replica, not the prompt space one. And then you compare them, and if necessary, do a compare and swap, and then try again. Um, you could do it like this, which is simply do a load and then restore. But that's completely unsafe, because you've got this race between the, um, the, the collector trying to do the store and the mutator trying to store something different. So we can do it with hardware transactions. It's very simple. Um, you just start a transaction off, um, do the load and store. Hey, we've done one field. Why not do lots of fields? Let's do another field and another field and so on. As many fields as we like. And then, and then we do an X end. Um, if something fails, and we don't expect it to fail, but if it fails, we can fall back to compare and swap. Um, so that's doing one object at a time. Well, if we can do one object at a time, remember we have about 16 kilobytes read and write set. Let's do loads. Let's do lots of objects. So we can copy lots of objects in the transaction. Um, and that, that works nicely. Let's see if we can think of getting, doing even more work. Now, what the transactions do is they track the, the, um, the cache lines that we've read and written. Um, so we're muddying it because we do a, when we're doing these copying objects, we're doing a lot of other work because we're having to find out where the where the reference, the two space reference is, and things like that. So there's a lot of work we have to do other than just do the, the reads and writes to the slots. Um, so maybe we could plan it. We could maybe we could take as much work as possible out of the transaction. So we could scan and record these objects, find out where they're going to point to, do all that outside the transaction. Then we start the transaction, copy all the objects, um, and then we finish. So we did that, and that, and that gives us, speed up, us a, a speed up of copying of about, uh, that's quite significant. I, I, I think I've got some figures. It's about, it makes it about twice as fast. Um, so, okay. Haswell's hardware transaction is quite nice. But can we do it in software with, um, and make it portable? So, uh, we, or I should say Tomoharu, um, tried a software transactional, uh, software transactional memory system. So, um, again, the idea is you do all these loads and stores, so you load, store, you do all, do all your work, and then when you finish doing those, you verify that your to space and your from space match. And someone else asked me, could I do that check later? I think Ben did. And so that's what we do. To make that work, um, you've got to put a fence in the middle. So one of the other issues about this kind of concurrency, you better put the fences in, in the right place <laughs> and you better not have too many of them. And it's a black art um, trying to figure out where to put them and to get that right. Um, so yeah, did it go faster? Uh, yes, it did. Um, um, so you can see we get a speed up of about 48 to 100%. And one of the interesting things is that um, 
and doing it with software transaction memory, which is the sort of pale grey ones, it's pretty damn much as fast as doing it with hardware transactions. And it's portable. So um, thank you, Intel, for encouraging us to explore this way. But uh, actually, we don't need your hardware anyway. We, 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 we can do it with ourselves in software. OK? So the obvious question is, is it correct? So, you know, that's your worry all the time when you're writing collectors. Is it correct? So what can we do to take it correct? First of all, assertions are your friend. If it moves, stick an assertion around it. Um, use them copiously. Uh, um, use them everywhere. Some um, system, I mean, Jack, for example, has a sanity checker. So after a GC, walk over your two space, check that all the references point where they should do, and all look same. You know, no references pointing back into from space, which is going to be reclaimed. I'm not saying you don't do this in a production world, but while you're testing, you do. You know, is every reference valid? Um, you can do testing, um, um, and which are, I guess, assertions of sanity checking, just a form of of testing, um, but you've got all sorts of nastinesses these days, you know, you've got threads scheduled concurrently, collections happen at different times, you've got relaxed memory, um, you know, how many tests are you going to do to believe it's correct, you know, are you going to run your test it 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, whatever. The other problem is using uh, large systems like Jags, you know, what does it mean to be correct? I can run on modified JAGs a large number of times, and you can bet it will crash or give the wrong answer, at least occasionally. Maybe, you know, twice out of a thousand or something. So, what does it mean to be correct? Do you say, well, my version with my improvements doesn't crash any more than the unmodified version? It's not a very good measure of correctness. Um, does Hotspot crash? Certainly. Son, it was in good shape. <laughs> of course it was. <laughs> it's probably gone downhill since then. <laughs> right. Okay, you have an advantage of slightly more users to, to, to give yes. you bug reports yes. than we do. Right, so that's the problem. So what did we, we do? We <coughs> did some model checking. Um, uh, we used um, a system called SPIN, and model checking is a, a verification technique for asynchronous process system. What you're trying to do is you're ver trying to verify some property such as an invariant. And what your model checker will do, it will visit all possible states that are reachable from some initial state, you know, by, by you know, the, the system uh, taking actions. And it will check whether the, um, the, the property holds in every state. The problem with model checking is your, your space can explode very large. So, hence, it's bounded. Um, your model must be fairly small. Um, we used SPIN. Um, SPIN is a fairly long-established model checker. Um, you write specifications in a language called Promala. Um, you describe uh, sequential processes, and you describe asynchronous communication through channels. So processes can send messages to each other through those channels. You can also share variables and so on. And your properties are basically assertions in linear temporal logic that you inject into the model. So we use SPIN, and we were not experts in model checking. Uh, Tom O'Hara did the work. We had a problem. Something wasn't wrong. So he said, I said, oh, we'll, we'll get together tomorrow on the whiteboard and scribble. And he said, no, 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 no. I'll go and do model checking. Um, and I don't believe he used spin before. But he went home overnight and he came back the next morning and said, yeah, it's broken. <laughs> I did a fix and it's still broken. <laughs> he said, don't worry, I did another fix and it's, and it's correct. So, you know, in less than 24 hours, using model checking, he found the bug and fixed it. So... Um, that sold me on what really did sell me on model checking because I hadn't, hadn't had any model, model checking before. Was that a bug in the algorithm then or, or a coding bug? It was a bug in the algorithm. Um, and uh, it was in particular, it was a bug in the algorithm for how you copy objects when they've been hashed. Um, and I, I'll, I'll mention that. Uh, so, um, so we have a model, we have a collector process. 
a mutated process. We model x86 is relaxed um, uh, memory um, by essentially having a local FIFO buffer store. Um, and we assume cache coherency. So this is, this is what, what the model looks like. A, a few slides, I'll, sh I'll show you the polymer. Um, so um, to be strictly honest, I meant to put backslashes at the end of every line of these macros, but I haven't <laughs> because it looks yucky and ugly, but assume the backslashes. So what does a mutator write do? Is it sends a pair AV to this mutator Q. It also stores that value in its local memory um, and it, it, it increases the count um, on that, the size of that queue, increases the size of the queue. Um, uh, what does a read do when it sees that? Um, well, uh, if, if there's nothing in the, the local mutator's queue, then it has to get the value from shared memory, otherwise it gets the value out of its local queue. So it's modeling the store load buffer. Um, we can have a commit which says, well, if we've got something in the, if we've got something in our queue, um, uh, then read that pair out of the queue, um, do, 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 the, do the write to shared memory and uh, decrement the size of uh, the count on, on that. Here's our memory process. So all these are just sort of defined to just find useful, useful actions. So here's our memory process. Um, this is the promula syntax for infinitely repeated, non-deterministic choice. So it says, essentially it says forever, either do that or that, and do it non-deterministically. Um, and we either, um, either we do the mutator action, or we do the collector action. So if you like, infinitely often, either the collector or the mutator is doing something. Um, so our scenario is very small, it remembers bounded, so we have a single object with a single non-reference field, and each semi-space contains one object. Um, this is what the mutator looks like. It says, again, it, again it's got this um, inf do uh, infinitely often, so either we'll do this or we'll do this. Um, the guard on both of them is true, so we can do either of them. So either we change the field, and we write it to both spaces. Uh, or um, the, um, the collector, or, or um, if we haven't flipped spaces, we read from from space, otherwise we read from to space, and here's the check. We need to check that we read what we wrote before. So the error is you read something that you didn't write because the GC and the mutator are out of sync. Um, uh, and finally, here's, here's, our, here's one version of our collector. So again, we've got this um, non-determinative choice. So we say, um, <coughs> we'll, we'll read a value from from space and from to space. If they're the same, we break, we don't do anything. Um, otherwise, they're different. We atomically, effectively, we do a, this bit in, in um, green is a CAS. We do the CAS to write. Um, uh, we have a fence at the end because this is where we, where we do the handshake as we change phases. I mean, we're changing phases here, we send flip this through. We always do a handshake there. So that's, that's the, the uh, code for CAS. Uh, here's, here's the code for uh, the software transactional memory. We read from both spaces. We, uh, oh sorry, we read from one space, we write to the other one, we do a fence, and then we, do, we read again from both spaces and we do the verify. Okay. Uh, and finally, again, handshake and flip phase. Um, so we, we tried this with Promola, checked that it was correct. It is correct. If you want to make it go wrong, Take the fence out. Take that red fence in the middle out, and, and and Spin will tell you that the model does not check. Keep the fence in, and it does check. So we have confidence. I mean, it's bound in model checking, so it's not a proof, but we have confidence that it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you know how deep the bounds are? Like how many objects, or is there a quantity that you can give for like an intuition for the size of the bounds, or not off the off? Or 
Well, you, you only need two strokes to prove it's wrong, right? But it doesn't prove it's right. But doing bad in model checking doesn't prove it's right. It gives you confidence. So well, I'm not confident that's what I'm correct. Yeah. Um, I've probably got some numbers somewhere, or, or something Tom or Harry might have, because it gives you a report of how, how big the, the space is and how long it took. But it, I mean, running these, it takes no time. It, it really does. So how do we get into all this? Well, one of the nasty things in Java is something called hash code. Um, so <coughs> when you call hash code on the object, it can perhaps consistently report the same integer. Um, and most, or a lot of systems, use address-based hashing. So the, if you take the hash code of an object, it's, its hash code is the address, which is fine. Um, or it's fine uh, until you copy the object, and its address has now changed. So what you do, you maybe put something in the hash code, in the you expand the header, put the hash code in the header, and the hash code there is where it was when it was first hashed. So uh, there are all sorts of um, uh, uh, nastinesses about this. Oh, sorry, that was just that. Um, and if you look at the sort of state transitions, you know, you can move from hashed, unhashed to hashed. Well, that's easy, you just return the address. Um, you can maybe copy an unhashed object, and that's easy. Um, if you hash it again, you just return the address. Um, but if it's hashed and you copy it, you've got to remember it's hashed and moved, um, and you've got to return the hash code word. And we have lots of problems with this. Because you imagine you're trying to copy an object at the same time as another thread is trying to take the hash code on it. Um, so many things happening all at once. Ouch, my head hurts. This is going to take forever to figure out. <coughs> Solution was we model checked it. Um, and that was the example I gave you. When we, our first algorithm was wrong, we model checked it and came up with a solution that, that works. Um, another nastiness of, of Java is it, um, it's Java uh, weak references. It's got a whole number of different flavors of weak reference. Um, Maybe you're familiar with them if you're Java programmers. If you're not, you don't want to be. Um, um, but essentially, uh, you can have a soft reference, you can have ref weaker references, which the garbage collector is, is free to clear at its discretion, essentially. Um, one of the problems with that is if you have a reference object which got this soft reference to some normal object, and I say get on that set of reference, it returns me a strong reference to this object. So that means in a concurrent setting, my garbage collector thinks this object is dead because it, it doesn't have to trace these weak references. One of my mutators is, is called get, and this object has suddenly become strong. So it's reachable. And so it's live. Um, and that and that's that's kind of kind of nasty. Um, so again, we use model checking on that. I'm just going to scan through these. So we have this nasty atomicity requirement. Um, so if the garbage collector decides to, to um, reclaim um, a softly reachable object O, right, it's got to clear atomically all references to O. So it's got to, atomically, it's got to clear that reference, and you have to clear that reference. And, and many more. At the same time, atomically. But we're an on-the-fly collector, we don't stop the world. If you stop the world, it's easy. But we're a strong on-the-fly collector, so we don't stop, stop the um, world. Ugh. The other it, nastiness about this is that the specification of um, weak references is informal and in English, which doesn't help. Um, so we corrected that, blah, blah, blah. Um, so what, what were our options for implementation? We could stop the world, we're not going to do that. We could block any mutator that calls get. We didn't want to, during DC, we didn't want to do that. Um, so we decided to process the object on the fly, never blocking a mutator other than scan its roots. And essentially, we, we have some kind of state transition system. We sort of start a normal start tracing. If anything, <coughs> any mutator calls get, we have to repeat the tracing and so on until, until we finish doing all the tracing, and then we um, move to clearing. Um, we looked at doing that in two ways. We could do that with an insertion barrier, um, 
Remember how I said insertion barriers work? You have this loop and keep on repeating. Um, uh, that works. The problem is it's got no guarantee of termination because that's the way that insertion barriers work. You keep going until your, your set of grey objects is empty. And then you scan your roots again. Oh dear, I've got some more work to do. Keep on going. Or you can do it with a deletion barrier in which termination is guaranteed. Um, oh, there's... Um, so as I said, insertion barrier, um, we, we have to keep on repeating, and that's a deletion barrier, we don't. Um, we wanted to be sure that we were correct, so we did model checking. Um, um, and these are the properties, you know, safety, a mutator will never see a reclaimed object, and consistency, once any get method calls, returns null, no other mutator will see, will see the reference to that object, and we'd like the GC to terminate. Um, so we, again, we model checked it. These two properties hold for both, both uh, barriers. Um, termination does not hold for the insertion barrier solution, because you might have to stop the world to finish. Um, but it does for the deletion barrier solution. So um, again, um, modern checking is, is, is really nice. Um, it gives us, that's another example, a third example of where it gave us convinced us that our solutions were correct. Um, and, we, and as I say, it's something you can learn to do at, re, at reasonable cost. Um, so, <coughs> just to summarize, um, on-the-fly copying collection for a full JVM is extremely complex. Um, abstractions and invariants, I think, are the key to comprehension. And model checking is a really practical way to provide a confidence in these algorithms. And it doesn't take you long to learn. Um, there are other ways to do it. I mean. And people like um, uh, Tony have um, um, formally verified on the on the fly collection. Did it take you more than 24 hours to do, Tony? No. No. <laughs> oh yeah. More like two years. It took us more like two years. <laughs> quite, quite. So your choice. Do a formal proof, and it takes you two years. Do model check and take you 24 hours, and you've got some confidence. Well, we have to prove them correctly. <coughs> Sorry? Confidence. We have, we have more you confidence. proven correctness. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. What's this? Yeah. So that's it. Questions?